it's 10 o'clock, and so I think we'll get started here. Hey, Valerie. Uh, we're going to be, um, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Mike Carlisle, the Executive Director of the Texas Tropical Trail from Corpus Christi, and uh, we have 58 joining us today wow. for our 15th virtual partner event, and this is our 186th partner event. And we want to thank Dr. Mendoza Garcia for her book prize last month, uh, Dancing Throughout Mexican History. Uh, Stephen New was our lucky survey drawing winner. So um, without too much more further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Miriam. Let's see, hold on here, just a second there. I'm going to introduce uh, Miriam. Sapala in the museum director of the Gilman Stained Glass Museum. Um, we're excited to hear more about the history and the background of the museum and a bit more about herself as well because she's uh, shared a little bit of history that she's had in the area down there. So Miriam, if you're ready. You're ready. Yes. Um, hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Miriam Spetha. I'm the museum director here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum. We're located in San Juan. Um, thank you for that introduction, Mike. I, um, I've actually worked with the Texas Tropical Trails before with uh, a side project that I've been helping with for the past, um, I guess, 10 years now, nine years now, with the CHAPS uh, project at UTRGV with Roseanne Bachagarza, Dr. Skronik, and Dr. Miller. Um, I, my, the little, my little baby that I try to help out with, and if anybody is familiar with the CHAPS project, um, it's a great project, but um, I'm not here to talk about the CHAPS project, but if you have any questions, I'm more than uh, able to facilitate some a conversation with the CHAPS project because there's always a project under development with the, uh, with the CHAPS project at um, UTRGV CHAPS department. So um, today I'm here to discuss uh, about the current project that I work with here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum. We are the largest and most comprehensive stained glass uh, museum here in the United States. And okay. I say that in the sense that it's not just stained glass art that we have. We have um, <clears throat> everything in our uh, collection is um, acquisitions of various masterpieces from the 19th to 20th century in the stained glass world, uh, including European stained oh glass, God. which is the Munich Mayer style, as well as the American Art Nouveau style of Tiffany Studios to John Lafarge, as well as uh, various, we have various artists um, that we have in our collection. Give me one second, because I, I hear chatter from the construction workers downstairs. So give me one second, so sorry. I'm so sorry, we're still under construction and um, nobody comprehends what a Zoom meeting is. So give me one second, so sorry. So sorry about that. I try to not have this meeting here, but it happened that way. So um, Mike is going to be helping me with this presentation, this PowerPoint presentation that I've created. Um, and so I have two videos for your uh, viewing entertainment, for your viewing pleasure that have uh, while we're under construction and to the point that we are at now. So um, please keep in mind that the first video that will be part of this presentation will show the stages of construction. To um, for everyone to better understand. So, Mike, if you could uh, change the slide, please. Okay, so the Gilman Stained Glass Museum, located in San Juan, is like I said, the most comprehensive collection of stained glass windows in the United States of America. Um, our patron here has been collecting for over 30 years and the building in the museum in itself has been under construction since 2016. Can you change the slide, please, Mike, please. 
We are a 501c3 and we're located across the Basilica of Our Lady of, Valle, of San Juan del Valle, which has over 1 million visitors. We are, um, and also is the number one tourist destination in the Rogani Valley across from us. We are the largest stained glass window exhibit in the country. We are, we are also the largest collection of Tiffany Studios stained glass windows. And we are also the only museum in the world to be solely constructed for the purpose to replicate cathedral cruciform architecture to display these choice specimens of American yeah. and European artwork. Excuse me? And Okay, I thought I heard something. You could change the next slide, please, Mike. Our goal here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum is to provide a transcendental experience for our visitors that can only be achieved in a sacred environment. Once again, um, due to the construction of the building in itself, we wanted to replicate that cathedral cruciform, uh, that cathedral feel when you go inside a church or a cathedral, for example. And everything that we have on display is a, a permanent exhibit. So all of these windows that we have saved from various churches across the United States, which I'll go into in, here in a little bit, has been given a specific place inside a replicated cathedral building, cathedral-like building. So you may have noticed us, I don't know if you've ever gone off of uh, 83, uh, going eastwards towards uh, the island from, you know, McAllen to Harlingen to San Juan area. We're located right across the Basilica of Our Lady of San, uh, San Juan, and um, we look like a church. So for the past, what, five years now, people have thought that we are a church, but in fact, we are a museum. Can you change the next slide, please, Mike? So this one is a video of the various stages of while we've been under construction. that we pride ourselves very much so here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum is that everything in our collection, except two, two windows that we have on display, but everything else, which is over 140 windows, as well as the um, six uh, altars that we have on display have been, um, for a better word, I like to say rescued, but we have uh, saved all of these pieces throughout the past 30 years and have brought them, yeah. um, saved them from, excuse me, saved them from desecrated churches in the past 30 years uh, throughout the United States. And that's something that we pride ourselves very much. So here at the Gelman St. Glass Museum is that in comparison to other museums, we are different in the sense that each piece in our collection in the acquisition of that item we have contributed back to the community in whatever way the church sees fit, whether it's just 
remaining their doors open as far as financial uh, needs that they may have, uh, to feeding the hungry, to clothing the poor, to opening their shelters. Various churches have various needs. And unfortunately, nowadays, you know, you have to remember that all of these pieces, once again, these are original antiques from over back over a hundred years ago, you know, maybe the, um, the oldest one, or the, I mean, the earliest, the youngest one is about 1920. Everything else is from the 1800s, 1880s to 1920. Oh and so unfortunately, when, you know, when we talk about the stained glass windows, a lot of people don't under, they don't, they don't think about that over a hundred years ago to, to now to over a hundred years later, these churches are closing. And what happens to these pieces of artwork that are part of the church? Where do they go? Some, some of the stained glass windows, unfortunately, if a new church comes in or if it's a developer that doesn't, has no need to restore, because it, it, it takes a whole process for these windows. If they have no interest in rescuing them or preserving them, they destroy them. And these are magnificent pieces of artwork that thankfully we've saved and contributed to the church's um, or to the community's purpose. And so here, for example, and I would like to, these are my, we have six altars on display, two of which are still, still remain their consecration, which is something that, you know, if you want to come, come in, I'll totally um, give you a whole spiel on that. But two of these altars that I personally love are these gold mosaic altars that are here on this uh, presentation before you. If you go to the next slide, Mike. If you were to do a Google search of Heroin Church Philly, you would find the um, Ascension of Our Lord Cathedral in Philadelphia. This is where those altars, if you can see before you, you can see where they used to be in Philadelphia at this. Um, this is actually the, the nicest photo that, um, that we have of, our, uh, of Ascension of Our Lord Cathedral. Because if you go to the next one, Mike, this is what you find. You find it filled with hero needles. You can go to the next one, please, Mike. It just, unfortunately, it's become um, a shelter. Uh, and, and there's controversy of which way you want to go about it. But um, it, for lack of a better word, um, it's just become a ruin. It's, it's, it's a ruin what's become of it. And, you know, um, it, it's been desecrated, graffiti, as you saw previously, there's heroin needles all over the place. And me being, you know, of course, there's the humanitarian part of it that feels sad about this, as well as, you know, pr the, pr the preserver for the arts. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to know that one, we've contributed back to this community to however it may be see fit to, to clothe and feed these people that are in unfortunate circumstances, as well as rescuing those altars and bringing them to a safe haven in South Texas. Of all places, South Texas, um, you know, over a hundred years ago, the, the, the priest and the parish, the parishioners would not have thought that these pieces would have been rescued and brought down to South Texas. You can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to just quickly bring about uh, our most recent acquisition is from uh, Grace Church in Plainfield, New Jersey. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that area or have ever visited this church. Um, we recently went during COVID, I personally went and uh, collected, or not collected, but uh, partook in the um, transportation of the windows. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Of uh, these, well, there are eight windows, but of our uh, rec most recent Tiffany angels that we have on display. Unfortunately, this church in Plainfield, New Jersey, 
you know, once again, um, churches are closing and with the pandemic, it's even taken a, a more stronger impact on these communities, especially the religious communities as nobody is attending uh, these churches. So uh, this acquisition of these windows, you could go to the next window, the next slide, please, Mike. Took over a year in the acquisition process because the church um, was hesitant in releasing these windows because once again, where are these windows going to, where are these windows going to go? Where are they going? Are they going to be preserved? Are they going to be placed in a sacred environment? Because over a hundred years ago in 1908, for example, these windows were commemorated to a certain individual. And unfortunately the church is now closing and um, they want to keep that promise with um, with those with those families over a hundred years ago. And once again, I'd like to highlight the fact that in comparison to other museums, even those that do have stained glass windows in their uh, collection, for example, like the Met or the um, the Dre House in Chicago or uh, di different different uh, national slash international museums, they will remove the the memoriam at the bottom and just have the window. And here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum, we are preserving not only the art but also the history of these individuals. Because at, at, at one point, at, at some time, these individuals were of some prominence and we want to identify who these people were and preserve their family name as well. You can go to the next slide, Mike, please. So something I would like to bring up that I'm sure everybody is familiar with is the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris that um, was unfortunately burned in 2019. Um, I myself never visited the Notre Dame. I don't know if anybody here on the chat has visited the Notre Dame, but when I speak about the Notre Dame and what has ha what had happened, there is a loss, a, sen a sentiment of loss and um, and pain when discussing this this cathedral. And and I bring this up because a lot of people, even myself that has never visited, feels saddened knowing that the history has been lost. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, here in 2020, there was a recent uh, fire at the Collegiate Middle Church in New York City. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that church. It was very proud to have a Liberty Bell that has been rung uh, since, um, I believe, since the revolution. Um, it's been rung for hundreds of years, right? And um, unfortunately, it burned in December. And it was actually um, interesting because I was actually there that weekend and went to go and interview Reverend uh, Lewis for a documentary that we are doing here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum. And they had 10 Tiffany windows. Uh, in the previous slides, I showed uh, some of the angels of, by Tiffany window, uh, Tiffany Studios. And so when I interviewed Reverend Lewis, she stated that she wished someone would have saved those windows. Those windows, you know, they're not just pieces of art. They're pieces of people's, uh, they're, they're um, parts of people's history, their memories, their weddings, their baptisms, their funerals, their, you know, any memory, fond memory, or even a, any memory you have in your community, especially in the religious community, and adorned with windows, those windows are part of your history as a child from, you know, growing up and, you know, ultimately to um, if somebody unfortunately had uh, passed away, those windows are a memory to someone in that church. And like Reverend Lewis said, she wished someone would have saved her, those windows because now they have uh, been lost to posterity. They've been, they perished in the flames and there's nothing that can be done with that. Um, the next slide, please, Mike. I think this one was supposed to be the video, but it's okay. We already saw the, the first video. It's okay. 
And so once again, um, history is being saved here at the Gelman Stained Glass Museum. These are uh, three of our um, Mary Tillinghast windows that we have on display. And as you can see, due to the comparison of that's actually me and uh, Senator Lucio when he came by to visit the museum. You can see how they are enormous and they are, you know, they're beautiful. These are not even lit at the moment. Uh, well, they're, not, they're now lit. This was a couple, this was earlier this year, uh, but I wanted to show the comparison in um, the ratio compared to our bodies here. These are what, about a 30 foot window and um, they're beautiful. And um, once again, we've saved not only the art, but also the history of these windows and um, the history of the people that they were commemorated for. actually did it for the state legislature of what's to come to the city of San Juan as um, you know we're just we're not just a museum we want to open this up to the community and allow you know uh, special events I don't know if anybody's familiar with like the Chris Kindle market in uh, Chicago or you know activities surrounding the arts that's something that we're going for as well as some of the clips from the video that was just presented also shows um, it's, it's bits of the documentary. Our working title that we have is called Divine Light. And it basically, um, it's still under production. We're still under production. 2023 is what I'm, my goal is that to get it out. And uh, it's basically saying, it's basically revealing this whole um, under, underworld of uh, the religious community and what happens a hundred years later and um, how um, the stained glass art is uh, underappreciated and how, um, you know, it, it's got a lot of aspects to it, but that's something we can talk about later. It just needs to open and we'll be opening in December 1st is our goal to be open and uh, we'll still be having um, things under development. That the, not everything will be completely to my satisfaction December 1st, I will be honest. But like I said, um, we have over 140 stained glass windows on display. And there's also other projects with this museum. And um, there's, there's so much to go with this museum. And if anybody wants to visit or has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer if anybody does have any questions. <laughs> Um, I have a question, Miriam. Yes. Um, this is Monica Burdett. Um, how is this funded? Is it all through a benefactor? Yes. At the moment, it is a sole patron. Um, he's been collecting for the past 30 years. And uh, at this moment, it's a private museum. There are uh, talks, future, you know, future discussions after he passes, but <laughs> at the moment, you know, he, this is his private collection and he's been collecting for over 30 years. And it's mm. finally, it's, it's more like his wife is like, get these things out of my garage. So <laughs> type of thing, but um, they're, they've been, he's been collecting for over 30 years. And finally 
uh, is ready to show it. You may, I don't know if you've ever been to the IMAS. There was a, the international, the museum in, um, in McAllen, the IMAS, they had a small exhibit of his windows. I don't know if you ever saw them. They had his JNR Lamb Studios. Um, it's about 14 windows that they had on display, which is not even the amount of windows that he has. And so he had that and he got the idea from them. And then uh, he, they told him, well, you know what? Uh, you should build your own museum. And so he decided to do it. And now that's where we are today. That's amazing and fantastic. and. I'm just overwhelmed. When you rescue windows from places where, like that um, church in Philadelphia, do you, do you, does the benefactor or whoever, you know, your board mm -hmm. or whatever, do you actually pay for those? Or is that what you were talking about of helping the community? That's how you do it. You put money into salvaging other things in exchange or how does that work? So it's a whole process with the board of the church, right? So they come in with a broker and then a negotiation is made and um, there, is, there is finances that come with it. You know, they're not gonna just give it away. They have sometimes uh, shipped in extra items because they don't have anywhere to go. And uh, for example, we one time got a, a, an extra altar. They're like, hey, it's not gonna go anywhere. Please take it. And we didn't even know. And then we ended up giving it to a, a church down here in South Texas. But uh, there is a, an exchange of uh, financial means of funding. And then that goes to that community, to the church's uh, purpose. And sometimes it's just to remain open because especially during COVID, they're, they're hurting. They're very, they're, especially in the Northeast coast, I'm sure you, we don't have that problem in South Texas, but churches are closing left and right in the Northeast coast. One more oh, question from Jim there. Yeah, I, I got several. Uh, is there gonna be an admission charge? There is an admission charge. Um, like I said, we are a private museum. So uh, general admission or you know, museum admission is $15 okay. for adults. And, uh, um, what, and what then- days, That's good, what, what days are you gonna be open? So right now we are open Tuesday through Sunday. Tuesday through Sunday. Okay. And at the moment, our hours are, they're still up for discussion, um, but we're open in the afternoons at the moment. If there's a group that you would like to coordinate, um, I can accommodate them in the morning. And this way you have the museum open to yourself, no, uh, no, nobody else. If you have a certain group, I can accommodate them. But of course that needs to be, uh, you need to make some arrangements with me and I'm sure. more than happy to help. And the, la the last question I'll ask is, uh, are you reletting each, each window as you're getting, are you rebuilding them uh, before you install them? Yes. So there is a whole process that well, comes to that. it. I know that, yeah. Yes, so the transportation, right? then the restoration, and then the installation. And so the installation, um, it depends on what type of window they are. If they're the Munich Mayer style, they are easier. They're usually just in like simple panels because they're single uh, layered. And then they're, each window has a dedicated metal frame as well as the wall is dedicated, the opening is dedicated as well to each, each and every window. Uh, for the American style of windows, they are more complicated because some of the windows are in six to 14 layers of glass. And so it's the same process. Uh, the restoration is prior and then the installation. And then there's also the illumination of each of these windows. Uh, I didn't I didn't really show it here in the video, but each window um, to preserve these windows for centuries later, um, we have replicated sunlight with LED fixtures okay. behind. So um, that was a project in itself because as I'm sure um, everyone knows here, you, you, can't, you cannot imitate, you can't replicate God. So you can't replicate sunlight, but we have uh, perfected it to the best of our abilities. And that's something that other, um, we pride ourselves here because if you compare to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they won't 
The stained glass artist will not illuminate masterpieces of stained glass art, even, even just regular stained glass, because the sunlight gives a certain illumination, certain brilliance that's very, um, it, it's, it's very beautiful. I don't know, there's no words to describe the sunlight. And that's something that um, it, the, this museum gives individuals is to appreciate the sun because um, there's that certain brilliance that comes through it. And it's not just yellow LED, it's yellow, it's soft white, it's red, it's I'm, blue, it's green. And then I'm it's- I'm gonna have to interrupt you, Marianne. <laughs> really, it's really, it's really a fascinating and interesting, but we're gonna have to move on. Yeah. But uh, really, thank you so much. And uh, I, I just hope everyone gets a chance to see it in person. And uh, when, thanks again so much. and. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our second program here with uh, Chris Mayer. He's the director of the King Ranch Visitor Program and the King Ranch Archives at the King Ranch Museum. And uh, he's one of our newest board members, and we feel fortunate to have him on our team. And uh, Chris is going to share the history and background of the King Ranch, uh, the Ranch Hand Breakfast and the La Posada. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Actually, I was uh, I was enjoying hearing Miriam's presentation. That's a fascinating museum. So looking forward to seeing that. Um, but yeah, I'm here with uh, uh, Janine Reyes, who's the Director of Tourism for the City of Kingsville. And uh, we've got a, a big weekend coming up uh, this weekend. So Mike asked me to, to hop on and talk about it a little bit. So uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the, um, the Ranch Ham Breakfast, and then Janine will talk about some of the uh, the things that the city has built uh, uh, to around the uh, around that breakfast. Um, you got the PowerPoint there, Mike. So yeah, we can go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Just so for anybody who's not familiar, I figured I'd do just kind of a kind of a basic overview. Uh, you know, King Ranch is founded in 1853 by Captain Richard King. You can see on the map there, it kind of uh, takes up a lot of the area between Corpus Christi and Brownsville. Um, it's 825,000 acres, uh, the largest ranch in Texas. On those green shaded areas, if you were to put them all together, um, it would be larger than the state of Rhode Island for, for context. Um, it's still a family owned business. Uh, they're in their seventh generation. It's, it's owned by descendants of, of Captain King. Um, and uh, it's got a, a, a big place in not just Texas history, but uh, in, in uh, kind of Western culture. Uh, we developed the Santa Gertrudis breed of cattle, which was the first new breed of beef cattle in, in North America. Um, the first, uh, you know, we've got a long uh, history with, uh, with quarter horses. Uh, the first registered American quarter horse uh, was a King Ranch horse named Wimpy. Um, and then uh, this year, 2021, is the 75th anniversary of the Triple Crown win. Um, Assault was a King Ranch horse that, uh, that won the, the three races of the Triple Crown in, in 1946. So um, a lot of different, a lot of different um, uh, uh, pieces of King Ranch in, in history. Um, yeah, we'll go to the next one there, Mike. So what we have coming up uh, this weekend is the 30th annual Ranch Hand Breakfast. You know, throughout the year here in Kingsville, the, the ranch has a museum in downtown Kingsville, and then we do uh, tours out on the ranch, a variety of different types of tours. Um, but uh, this is a, the, a once a year event for us where we let people drive their own vehicles onto the ranch, and then we offer a, a cowboy breakfast. Um, didn't get to do it in 2020 for obvious reasons, but um, uh, that would have been our 30th anniversary for the breakfast, so we're celebrating our 30th uh, this year. Um, so just for the logistics of it, it's from seven to 11, um, uh, out on the ranch and, uh, tickets are $6 each. The breakfast is, uh, you know, eggs and, uh, you know, sausage and tortillas and all the things a growing boy and girl needs, uh, so they can, uh, you know, uh, to, to, you know, work, uh, work the range. Um, it happens uh, out uh, near our uh, show arena out on the ranch, and uh, the, the photo you see there is uh, kind of just the, the general crowd from a couple of years ago. Um, go ahead and move on there, uh, there Mike. So yeah, uh, the meal is prepared by, uh, by King Ranch employees, so they get out there about three o'clock in the morning and start, uh, you know, start, start cooking, so uh, they'll have everything ready to go as 
people uh, as people start showing up, you know, people will start lining up as early as 630 in the morning and then they'll be there uh, all throughout the day. Um, we do have, uh, as I mentioned, you can park your own vehicle on the ranch, drive your own vehicle and park. Um, there's also parking in downtown Kingsville and they'll, they'll run a shuttle from the uh, from near the train depot in downtown Kingsville, which I'm sure Janine will talk about more here in a minute. <laughs> but uh, go ahead and move on. Uh, go ahead and move on. Mike. Um, so anyway, th for the breakfast, um, we'll, uh, you know, like I said, tickets are six dollars. Um, we are offering at the, the visitor center. Usually we offer two tours a day. We're offering six that day right now, and we're looking at adding a couple more um, if we can get the logistics to work out. So um, you can definitely come and have the breakfast and then uh, take one of our regular tours of King Ranch as well. Um, and those tickets are, are available online on, on the King Ranch website. <laughs> so I'll jump in and um, hopefully y'all can hear me. I'm Janine Reyes again, Director of Tourism here for the city of Kingsville. And um, in appreciation of this great history uh, and tradition of the King Ranch Ranch Hand Breakfast, the city over the years has developed a number of events to surround that event. And so we start Friday night uh, with our annual tree lighting. It's uh, always the Friday before Thanksgiving because the breakfast is always the Saturday before Thanksgiving. So typically we'll have, uh, and we will again this year, have live music out there. Um, we ask the shops to stay open late because uh, this is right in front of our train depot, which is right uh, along our main street district. Uh, the King Ranch Saddle Shop does have their flagship store out there. Um, and that's also where you can park Saturday morning. Uh, but last year, with uh, COVID in play, we were not, uh, we were missing out on this on this weekend and our merchants as well. So we went ahead and created a holiday wine walk sip and shop um, in an effort to separate people and still bring them out downtown. Well, it was uh, such a success that we're adding that this year to the tree lighting. So kind of a growing series of events that we have um, here in the city of Kingsville. So it'll be a, a wine walk entry lighting starting at five o'clock for the wine walk. Now you do not need to participate in the wine walk to attend, but if you do, uh, you get a nice fancy passport packed with savings. Um, you will get a series of coupons in there. Uh, we've got a stamp system where you can go down our main street and collect various stamps from merchants. And we've got a number of ways, uh, fun ways for you to win some prizes. Uh, we have alcoholic and non-alcoholic passports available. So the alcoholic passports will come with a keepsake glass, a wine glass lanyard, um, and it, the samples of the wine. We have 18 varieties of wine, five craft beers that will uh, be included in our wine walk, and a Wild Horse Distillery rum beverage. Wild Horse Distillery is our uh, local award-winning win Texas-made rum. Um, so they're always a neat partner of ours. And then we've got a non-alcoholic option, um, which for the kiddos or anyone who opts not to partake in the alcoholic option, uh, it will feature six varieties of sparkling beverages. We've got sparkling cider, sparkling grape juice, uh, and they will get a glow in the dark cup uh, if they choose to participate in that. Uh, again, passports are sold. They're $25 for the alcoholic, 15 for the non-alcoholic, Come with all of the goodies um, and opportunities to win and um, they do go up day of so I recommend you purchase those in advance and you can do that online at ranchhandweekend.com uh, as you see there on your screen so I think we can go to the next slide um, and I will just say I've got a special code for you guys if you want to participate in that alcoholic wine walk so I'll tell you at the end but of course so that's Friday night Saturday morning is the breakfast there on the ranch from 7 to 11 and then we invite you back to our historic downtown. Here's a, a snapshot along Main Street where we have our Ranch Hand Weekend Festival. Uh, that runs from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. downtown. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I think you'll see just some of the components of that. So uh, the university uh, participates in a steamroller uh, art printing exhibit. And I'm actually really excited because they haven't uh, been at our festival for the last few years, but I've heard wonderful things about this. Um, and I think if you go to the next slide, you'll see a little bit about, yeah, the kids corral. So there'll be inflatables for the kids. There's uh, rock painting, uh, there's succulent planting, 
um, with various different partners. Uh, also on our main stage, we'll have live music. We've got line dance and two-step lessons and contests. Um, I think there's snag golf. So there's a lot of different activities definitely to keep everybody entertained throughout the day. And again, if you if you opt to, you know, it's the only time of the year you can drive onto the ranch. If you opt to park there in downtown in the morning at our train depot, you can actually pick up your breakfast tickets there, shuttle onto the ranch, and then shuttle right back into downtown where all the festivities will be going on until four o'clock that day. And I think next slide. Uh, also, the Kingsville Symphony Orchestra takes part in this epic weekend, and so they will be having a King Ranch celebration that will be Saturday also at three o'clock. Um, so that's always a part of the fun. So festival goes so far, but you can kind of bounce around to these different components. And uh, if you go to ranchhandweekend.com, we have a link where you can go purchase those tickets as well. Next slide. And then uh, we end the night, so we culminated with our Ranch Hand Weekend Country Concert. This year we're bringing out Steve Warner with Isaac Jacob and Lauren Corzine. We're super excited for that. Um, each year our concert and the Wine Walk also benefit a different nonprofit. This year's beneficiary is Toys for Tots of Clayburg and Kennedy County. So uh, all the proceeds from the ticket sales, from those passport sales, uh, will go directly to them. Uh, two years ago, when we did just the concert, we made 42000 for our KISD Education Foundation. And uh, one year ago, when we subbed it with the Wine Walk, we made uh, 29000 um, for the Boys and Girls Club. So uh, we're excited to be able to give back as well to Toys for Tots, and we hope to raise enough to last them for the next couple of years to come. Uh, but again, you'll see there on the bottom, ranchhandweekend.com is where you can go and get all of our tickets. Um, if you need to come pick up your passport and you haven't yet purchased your breakfast ticket, we do have those on hand. So we're happy to sell those Bref breakfast tickets are only cash money order check. Um, so you kind of have to get those in person, but, uh, you can pick them up, you know, as you're trading in for your passport or what have you with us. So we'll have them at all of our locations. Our tickets, you can purchase online there at ranchhandweekend.com. Um, and if you all choose to purchase that uh, today, we do have a special discount code. It is KBC for Kingsville Visitor Center. That will get you $5 off of your concert ticket and will get you $5 off of your alcoholic passport. And that's yeah, about it. <laughs> thanks, Jen. I'll, uh, I'll uh, put that uh, code in the, uh, in the comments as well. Um, I should also mention that, you know, the tickets for the breakfast are $6. Uh, all the proceeds from that go to fund the La Posada de Kingsville Christmas events downtown. So that was actually the purpose of the breakfast when it was started 30 years ago was to act as a fundraiser for the, the Christmas activities that we have. Um, yeah, the only other thing I, uh, from that was the, uh, you know, the, the Kingsville Symphony Orchestra concert that they have is one of my favorite events for that from that weekend. Um, you know, it's not the, you know, more, more buttoned up typical stuffy concert environment. They do a lot of, you know, Western movie themes and have a lot of fun. So, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a great event. But yeah, does anybody have any questions that we could help answer? We must have done a good job. <laughs> excellent, excellent, and uh, thank you. You Chris. won't be bored this weekend in Kingsville. I can promise you that. <laughs> it looks like there's a lot of fun, and we appreciate that code. And uh, if you could, could you put that code in the chat so people? Yeah, that's what I'll do here. In just okay, a second. perfect, yeah, yeah. perfect. And uh, I just want to. Uh, thank you again, Chris. I know you've been real busy, but I appreciate you. Uh, stepping yeah, up. we are. And, and I will say, um, yeah, we might we might hop off the call here in a second. You know, there's a million things that have to get done between now and Saturday. So Friday. But yeah, or, uh, well, yeah, Friday. Sorry. <laughs> I have to just have to keep myself from there. <laughs> so. All righty. Well, thanks again. Thanks, and uh, with that, we're going to move to our next program. That's uh, Zachary Taylor's Army in Texas, 1845 to 1846 with Jim Maloney, our historian and author. And uh, yesterday, uh, Allison Ehrlich was called into jury duty. And so she had to miss our meeting today. So it's gonna be rescheduled for our December meeting. So uh, Jim's gracefully gonna share a little bit more uh, about Murphy Givens as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jim. Well, why don't you put the screen up? 
uh, start okay. the program. Let me get this. I, I will say that museum in, in uh, San Juan looks awesome. And I, I've been to the Driehaus Museum in, San Ant in uh, Chicago, along with the, the St. Glass Museum they had. And this, this one looks just fabulous. Anyway, uh, as many of you know, I have been over the past 12 years, been privileged to work with Murphy Givens. Uh, publishing the books, mostly that Murphy has written, and some I'm titled as co-author, but mo mer most of the words are Murphy's. Uh, I can t tell you that Murphy passed away last December of, of, uh, of, of lung cancer. So the book that we're bringing out, uh, hey, we've just brought out, is his last one. Uh, it's Zachary Taylor's Army in Texas. Mike, change, please. So this is a cover of, of, of the book. It is uh, brand new, came out about three weeks ago. And uh, the cover shows Corpus Christi in 1845 with the US Army spread out along the, uh, the, the Bay Shore. Next slide, please. please. So in uh, August of 1845, General Zachary Taylor, uh, came to South Texas to protect Texas from, the, Me from uh, the country of Mexico. In 1845, the US voted to annex Texas into uh, becoming a state. And Mexico said that that was an act of war. And so uh, President uh, James K. Polk sent Zachary Taylor to South Texas with an army to protect our interests. And they first landed, next slide please. They first landed on St. Joseph's Island, across from today's Port Aransas. And when they landed on that island, uh, they had to anchor the ships offshore and take small boats and uh, take them into shore. So it was a long, laborious process of unloading the soldiers and the horses and the goods and getting them on to St. Joseph's Island. There were two or three families living on St. Joseph's at the time. And the US Army soon discovered that there wasn't a lot of fresh water there, but you could locate some fresh water by digging, digging the down about two and a half feet into the sand. And when you got down that deep, you would run into water and the top layer of water was fresh. The water, fresh water would float on the salt water. So that's how they got their, their uh, water as long as they were on that island. So they uh, decided to, they had to go somewhere else. Uh, they, they went to Rockport uh, and decided that that was not the right place for them. So they were convinced to come to Corpus Christi and they went through Turtle Cove and you can see that on the slide. Uh, they went to Turtle Cove and that had about two and a half feet of water in it. So uh, it took very shallow boats to get through that cove to get into Corpus Christi Bay and come across the bay. So the first soldiers uh, came, finally got through to Corpus Christi in August of 1845 and landed on North Beach. Next slide, please. And they found this little town along the bay. And there were about 100 people living in Corpus Christi. Henry Kinney had his, uh, his stockaded trading post up on the bluff. But down along the edge of the bay were some houses. And you can see they were sur surrounded by stockades to protect from Indians also. And uh, as I said, there were about 100 people living here in Corpus Christi. And it was primarily a smuggler's haven. Men would bring goods from primarily from New Orleans that uh, were wanted in Mexico. And Mexico had a high tariff on imported goods. Anything that came from outside of Mexico had a 10% tariff put, put on the goods. And so it actually paid and they would have to, they would have to take them uh, a long way to get, get uh, into Mexico anyway. So it, it became easy to bring them to Corpus Christi wagon trains and traders would wander into Corpus Christi with goods, uh, primarily gold, silver, hides, and some cotton, and trade them for what the Texans had brought in. And that was, was normally, it would be tobacco, uh, dyes, calico cloth, items that were needed for everyday life in, in Mexico. And so there was a trade going on, and that continued for many years after, after, after this also. 
but uh, Corpus Christi was the most convenient place to, to, to come into. And they could either go into Reynosa or Laredo. All along the Rio Grande, it was about a 200-mile uh, trip uh, for, the, for the soldier, for the, the, sale, uh, the traders. So Corpus Christi became a trading hub. And so Zachary Taylor came here. And let's go to the next slide. And he settled the army along the Nueces Bay, or along Corpus Christi Bay. Uh, they eventually had almost 4,000 soldiers here. The hamlet that uh, had 100 uh, people living here eventually grew to about 2,000. And they were, uh, they were traders, they were gamblers, prostitutes, all kinds of people that were here to make a buck off of the army. And the army settled in the, uh, along the bay and it became home from August of 1845 till March of 1846. And while they were here, the army drilled uh, extensively. Prior to Corpus Christi, the first time a large army had been assembled in the United States was the War of 1812. So since eight, between 1812 and 1845, the army had been divided up in small groups. Uh, they were in forts around the Western coast along Canada and along the uh, Atlantic Ocean, protecting the United States from Indians, uh, the British interests and, and uh, people along, uh, along the coast. And so uh, the army had to learn to be an army again. So Zachary Taylor, uh, having fought in the, the War of 1812, actually, came here and the, they, they started drilling, learning how to uh, maneuver in large groups of, of, of men, uh, marching in unison and so forth. All that stuff had to be relearned by the US Army. Uh, it was manned primarily, the officers were primarily uh, West Point officers who had been, had been through four years at West Point and had been trained in the art of uh, maneuvering armies and, uh, and war and knew the tactics and so forth. So they had uh, six or eight months to do that in Corpus Christi. Uh, it was a very idyllic spot for the fall. You know, we all know how beautiful Texas is in the fall and late summer. And, uh, but in the winter, it was, it was tough. We, on, uh, on January 6th, they had a norther go through, uh, took the temperatures down to 23 degrees. And the, uh, those tents that the guys were living in were not very comfortable and their, their uniforms, uh, they were not really set up for that kind of cold weather. So it was a serious problem. And also they had some really drenching, terrible rains that, that came down at the same time. So after, uh, after the fall, beautiful fall, Corpus Christi became a uh, less than inviting place in the winter. And so by, by the beginning of mid of February, they were ready to roll. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, well, there's another another picture of the of the slide. If you'll look up on the right upper right hand side, that is where that little town was that we showed earlier on. That is today where the yacht club is in Corpus Christi. It's the uh, northern or the southernmost. Uh, it's the L head that's up there where the yacht club is, and that's where deep water was. There, there's a stream that runs into uh, that the bay up there, and so it had scoured out some deeper water so boats could get in closer to shore. So the army was actually fairly far away from the, the early settlement. Next slide. Okay, here is a view of today's Corpus Christi and where the army was encamped along the bay. Each of those triangles is a different uh, infantry group. And you can see that there were seven different infantries along the, along the bay. And uh, today, so they were spread out on the southern end of North Beach and the northern end of downtown, uh, relatively close to where uh, I-37, it, it ended about where I-37 comes in, into uh, the shoreline today. And it went up to where the, uh, the Harbor Bridge uh, begins to start. It, the road from Portland comes across, it makes a curve. And then at the bottom of the uh, bridge access, it's, it straightens out, and that's where the, the, the northern end of the army was. So it uh, gives you an idea where the army was at that time. Uh, the, the troops actually drilled a well, or dr dug a well in uh, Artesian Park, which is still there today. The well is, is not 
uh, access at all because it is uh, not a very drinkable water. It's mostly sulfuric, so it tastes terrible. But that's where they were. Let's go to the next slide. So it became time to leave Corpus Christi and march to the valley. They started out on March 6th, and every day a different uh, one quarter of the army left and went south. And they did that because they, there was only so much uh, drinking water and supplies along the way. And so they spaced them out so they weren't on each other's tail. They went first, they went straight west to where the bridge crosses uh, the Nueces River to go, go north on I-37 a day. That was Nueces, the, it was called the Mots. It's where a little town of Nueces town was uh, to be established. And they marched from there south. They went uh, to what is now Kingsville today. Uh, and the Santa Gertrudis Creek. And then he went straight south, pretty much following Highway 77 all the way to the valley. What Highway 77 was eventually built uh, along that same route. They got down to, uh, you can see where Port Mansfield is. Uh, they ran into an arroyo there and uh, the Mexican army was arrayed on the south side of the army and dared the U.S. to cross. And uh, so eventually all four sets of the army bought, was bottled up at that, that arroyo trying to figure out what to do. And finally they decided they were gonna take the bluff and they were gonna cross the, the arroyo. So the first company of men were stripped down to their waist and they had their rifles uh, held above their heads and they started marching across that arroyo uh, in chest deep water with the artillery and the rest of the army all at, at, at the ready on the other side, on the north, north side of the arroyo. And we got, they got to the middle of the, uh, the arroyo and there was no action. It turns out that the Mexicans had faked having a large air army across the arroyo and were bluffing and hoping that they could turn the US back. And of course that did not happen. So they continued on south and they got to the Rio Grande right across from Matamoros. And let's go to the next slide, please. And they built a fort, which they called Fort Texas initially. And it was a dirt fort. Uh, all the walls were 15 foot thick, but they, they would dig, dig dirt and pile it up into uh, walls. Uh, and you can see the Rio Grande there. And on the other side was, was uh, the Mexican army and uh, the Mexican town of Matamoros also. And so they built that fort and as time went on, uh, it was, took about two weeks, but it went, eventually was about finished. And at that time, Zachary Taylor took his arm, some of the army and went back to Port, or went to Port Isabel to uh, make sure that everything over there was, was okay and to get some more supplies. And as soon as they left, the Mexicans started bombarding that fort and uh, they shot it for several days. And eventually Zachary Taylor came back. Let's go to the next slide. And we had the Battle of Palo Alto on May 8th, 1846. Uh, 1,700 men, nope, wrong one. 2,288 US soldiers ran into uh, 3,709 Mexican soldiers at Palo Alto and uh, Mexicans had the road blocked. So they had an artillery battle for several hours on the afternoon. Uh, at the end of the day was is mostly a draw, although the US had the best of it. They had nine men killed and 47 wounded and two missing. And Mexico had 102 wounded, 129 or 102 killed, 129 wounded and 26 missing. So they went to, went to sleep that night on the battlefield, ready for the next day. And let's go to the next slide. They found that the Mexican army had uh, retreated and they had gone to a better spot, uh, Orisaca, that was fortified, they could fortify. And so they, he, they had uh, 4,000 men in the Orisaca. They, were, they were, uh, had some reinforcements at night and the US had took 1,700 men to chase the, the Mexican army. They got to the Orisaca. The Mexican army was all aligned across that Rosaka, ready for the army. But Zachary Taylor, in his in his wisdom and, and uh, st strength, only attacked one section. He attacked where the artillery was, and the U.S. took was able to take the artillery 
and turn around and use it on the Mexican army that was arrayed on both sides of them in the Arroyo. And the Mexicans could not shoot back all that easily because the U.S. was, uh, the Mexican army was on both sides and they would be shooting their own men. So in that battle, the U.S. had 33 killed and 89 wounded versus 154 Mexicans uh, were killed, 205 wounded and 156 missing. missing. So they retreated back to Matamoros. And uh, when they retreated back to Matamoros, they uh, eventually left Matamoros. They did not want to uh, try to defend it. And they, the Mexican army retreated to Monterey. Let's go to the next slide. So Zachary Taylor uh, was the general. Uh, he became quite popular in the US. He continued on further into Mexico and uh, he eventually became president of the United States uh, in 1848 or eight, early 1849. And he died 16 months later of a sudden uh, stomach disease. I assume he had a ruptured uh, ulcer or something like that. So Zachary Taylor uh, had become popular and, and went on to uh, the presidency. Next slide, please. U.S. Grant was the other soldier that fought at, or that was at Corpus Christi. And we all know his story. He uh, was not very successful after the war, stayed in the army for a few years, tried being a merchant, tried being a farmer. Uh, but when he, when the Civil War came along, he was given command of a, of a small army in, in uh, Illinois. And eventually he rose to be the top general in the US Army and won the Civil War for uh, the North and uh, eventually became president of the United States. Next slide. So what do we have left in Corpus Christi? There are several things left in Corpus Christi today. This is the monument at Artesian Park. That's the mileage marker. When you are coming in I-37 or uh, down uh, 77 and it says 42 miles to Corpus Christi. It's 42 miles to that monument in Artesian Park. That's also used as our mileage marker. But that was erected years later in memory of Zachary Taylor being here. The only other, there are two other things that are in Corpus Christi. Seven men were killed in, the, uh, in an explosion of a steamship and then others died uh, while in camp. And so uh, their bodies are buried in Old Bayview Cemetery. Uh, their grave locations have been lost, but the, the bodies of all the men that died in Corpus Christi in the army are, build, are buried just north of downtown across uh, the highway from downtown in uh, Old Bayview Cemetery. And it's a beautiful spot. And the other thing that's left in Corpus Christi is an old chair that is uh, at the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History. I'm talking, I'm doing this talk a little longer tonight at the uh, Corpus Christi Museum. And uh, we'll be showing that chair among other things. So uh, if, if anybody would like to join us to, tonight uh, at the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History, you're very welcome to do it. Next slide. It'll be, the door is open at 6.30 and it will be, uh, the talk will be at seven. So Christmas is coming, books make great presents. Let's go to the next slide. That's the book, Merc uh, Zachary Taylor's Army in Texas. It's $45, uh, $44.95, and you can order it online at our website, www.newasispress.com. I will have books at the uh, museum tonight along with all the other books. Let's go to the next page. Uh, I have a special sale on the 1919 Storm Book. It's $20 at the, on the website or tonight. Uh, I had a whole bunch printed for the uh, centennial, and I have a whole bunch left. Uh, so I'm putting them on sale to try to clear the stock. Let's go to the next page. So these are some of the other other newer books. I think I've talked to, to this group about all of them. Uh, they're also available at the website as well as tonight. And all of our other books are also available. So again, it's www.newasispress.com. And uh, you can call me at 361 Two eight nine zero one zero zero, and I will also be able to uh, work with you. So uh, that's some of the other books. Uh, thank you for letting me talk about Zachary Taylor and his army in Texas.
So I think it's 11.05 and I think I was told, told to be done by then. I really appreciated your presentation, uh, working with the Traps Department with the Civil War. I just texted them and I told them about the new book. So um, I'll be in contact with you. Um, Jim, is your name? Yeah. Yeah. Jim? Yeah. yeah, I don't know whether you're gonna have a bookstore at, the, at your museum. I'm, I'm gonna to try to get down there. I love stained glass. I've got about 15 windows hanging in my house. And so uh, oh, nice. I will be looking forward to coming to your museum. I'll, I'll get your contact information from Mike. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Jim. We really appreciate that. That was a, always a great presentation and I appreciate you stepping in and uh, filling in some of the time we had and uh, hope everybody enjoys coming to, uh, to our next meeting on December 14th when uh, uh, Allison will share her presentation or Throwback Thursday. So she's a columnist here and I think everybody will enjoy that one too. I saw Allison's presentation a couple of weeks ago at the Corpus Christi Museum and their, their uh, October presentations, and she did an awesome job. You really enjoy her talk. That's what I heard. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Valerie Bates. Our... Thank you, Mike. Um, if y'all can hear me, if not, that yes, may sure. be just as well. Sure we can. <laughs> um, well, we appreciate everybody joining us this day, uh, today. Uh, great content as usual. And I will say uh, that Zachary Taylor's presence had the same effect on Port Isabel. We had about 200 inhabitants at uh, the time of his arrival here. And we don't even have a chair to show for it. But there's um, a, a, a little site. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're That's true. Um, yes, we need to do better yeah. at the oh. interpretation of that port uh, of the, that fort. There was a brochure printed in 1954 by uh, what was known as the Coastal Hotel at the time. And so 1954, part of, of uh, what was boasted in that brochure was that the visitor to Port Isabel could talk to locals whose parents knew Zachary Taylor. <laughs> so there were still stories circling around, you know, a hundred years later um, about, I mean, he was just, he was quite a character. So um, it's very much our roots and we have a, a lot of shared similarities uh, between Port Isabel and Corpus Christi as a result of that. Um, yes, as uh, Mike announced uh, December 14th, um, that's different. It's uh, moved up a week. That's the second Tuesday in December for our partner event, which will be virtual. We're inching closer to a return to in-person meetings, um, and it's about time. In the discovery phase, we've surveyed partners and sites to see that where they were at in terms of in-person events like ours, um, you know, a, and are, are they open and ready to receive uh, groups of 30 to 40 to 50 people? And so we're working through those logistics. Um, and that's just an ongoing process. And also wanted to let you all know, representing the Tropical Trail region, we work the Texas Historical Commission booth at State Fair for two of the busiest days in October. Uh, it was, uh, uh, Mike was booth manager as executive director of the Tropical Trail region. And um, uh, for those of us who hadn't been around that many people in a couple of years, well, it was a lot. Uh, we had well over a thousand interactions in those two days. Um, we answered a lot of questions about things we didn't even know, but that's what we specialize in. I'll say that we discovered the top two motivations for planning travel, travel are education and history, which is us. So that, that was uh, really exciting as people would approach, approach the booth and talk about uh, why they were there and what they were looking for. So we, we're just really excited about that because we've been ready for this for a long time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, were, we participated in the Welcome Home RGV's Connection Fair in McGallan, and it was sort of a glimpse into the anticipated return of the Winter Texan. I will say that the numbers were down. I'm finding conversations with local businesses here that are already seeing the Winter Texan uh, population return. That numbers are down, but they are uh, very engaged. Um, and you know, speaking from the retail side of it, they are already spending more money. So uh, we're excited to see them come back, resume some normalcy. 
Uh, we're also working on a museums of the Tropical Trail Region brochure, which we're about ready to go to print with. Uh, the first run will be 10,000, 10, and we have a distribution and plan, plan in place that'll be very aggressive. So we hope to get through those uh, 10,000 brochures within six months so we can get the message out to the visitors of, uh, of all the museums that we have in our area, which uh, right around 80. Uh, Miriam, it's so exciting to see uh, in the middle of, of all the challenges to see uh, new museums uh, grow. Uh, you know, I mean, from the, from the ground up, uh, I, it just, um, you know, it's like the canary in the cage, if you will. Uh, if a museum can come online and survive, it's better for everybody. So we wanna do our part in getting your message out there. Um, so thanks, I wanted, to, I wanted to add all that to say, um, that is thanks to the support of the partners. Um, the monies that we fundraise from you all, this is where it goes. Um, to being able to get your message in front of audiences. So we depend on that. And we know that, that you depend on what we can do to bring visitors to your door. Uh, so having said that, Mike will be sending out uh, solicitation letters or fundraising letters or newsletters or just good news will arrive in the mail to you, uh, including a uh, the new museum brochure. We ask for your support. We are mandated to... Uh, supplement our grant money with support that we can raise from you all. We depend on it and um, hope you can participate in that. We look forward to December 14th when we can all get together again. Thanks for such great, great content today. Congratulations on a brand spanking new museum. Looking forward to a visit in person there. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got to have a Zachary Taylor book. So I'll be logging on to the website uh, immediately uh, enjoyed the presentations, everybody. Mike, do you have anything to add? No, I think that just concludes our program today. And uh, I appreciate everybody joining us and, uh, and all your support and the great comments uh, that you've made in the chat. And uh, I just, uh, we're now going to close the meeting. We're, we're going to start our business meeting in a little bit. Uh, uh, we'll have a short video of our, our board members and stuff. So, uh, if you want to stick around and listen to the board meeting, that's fine. But if not, we'll see you next month.